good day. This is Word Harriman, AE6TY. A few weeks ago, Bill Conwell, K2PO, sent me an email saying that he had published an article in February QST 2021. And in that article, he had used SimSmith to tune his vertical to two different bands, one at 160 and one at 80. He was kind enough to send me a copy of his video, which I'll try to put a link to down below. And in it, he showed how he interactively used SimSmith to do the match. And in watching the video, he, he did a good job of showing what SimSmith can do using the, the fundamentals that have been around for a decade or so. But there were some things that he did not use, which I think would have substantially simplified his, his effort. So I thought I'd put together a little video showing how you can use some of the more advanced features of SimSmith to solve this kind of problem. And in the end, I ended up being obsessed, which is often happens with me. And I decided to go off and try some other topologies to do the matching and ended up doing some work on the SimSmith optimizer as a result. The optimizer that you will see is in version 18 which is in beta right now. If you're interested in playing with or send me an email or something, I'll send you a pointer to it. Now, Bill started out by doing measurements on his vertical, which is a, generally a good idea. And he was kind enough to share that data with me. And he was going to work from 1.8 to four, and I'm gonna put in some extra points so things are nice and smooth. So I set 1.8 to four. I'm gonna turn on the sweep, and then I'm gonna show the sweep down here. And here is the data from his original antenna. Now he wanted to match two different frequencies, and those two frequencies need to be marked up here. And he constantly went back and forth trying to move this dot right here back and forth as he changed the frequency in which he was interested. In order to avoid having to do that, one way to do that is to simply put a marker on this. So I'm going to put one marker at 1.84 because that's kind of the middle of where I want to be working in the 160 band. I'm going to put another mark here, up here at about 3.6. Again, it's kind of in the region where I want to work. I could adjust these easily enough. So now his goal was to figure out how to get this moved down to here and this moved down to here. And he was interested in the SWR2 circle, so I'm going to set that to be 2. And so now here's his goal. Now he jumped immediately to an answer. He kind of went at it in an intuitive way. His goal was to move this down and the way you move things down is with a series capacitor. So he just put in a series capacitor. I'm going to move these markers to G. They got put on the wrong thing. Uh, 1.83. You can see it's on L. I really want it on G. 3.6. And I'm going to turn off L so it's not confusing me. So we put in this capacitor, and lo and behold, the 160 came down here pretty nicely. Now he used, to make these adjustments, he used these arrows right here. And that's perfectly legitimate. You can also use the up and down arrows on your keyboard, which I'm doing right here. Or you can select this field and just use the wheel. So I'm going to use the wheel on my mouse. And you can see that I can move the 160 meter band up and down pretty well. And it has relatively little impact on the 80 meter band. Now the next problem 
was to get the this all the way down to here. And you can see the resistance is, is pretty high, so I need to move that resistance down. And he jumped right to the chase, and he used a transmission line, which was about five feet long. That's where he started. And you can see now this is pretty good. It's got... It's got a resistance that's kind of in the right ballpark. And if I, if I move this a little bit, I can adjust. See this R right here? I can adjust this so that it's kind of near 50. And now if I just add an inductor, I get this at 49 and this at 44, and now I can just start playing. So I need to move this point up. So let's change my inductor. Again, I'm just using the wheel. Of course, that inductor moved my 160, so now I want to move my 160 back down. And they're both going through kind of the left-hand side of this, so maybe I can change this and then I can put this in and change that back and change that down and so now I can click on each of these parameters and using the wheel I can get kind of where I want to go and I I, I can I can tune this kind of I can keep tuning this and as you easily understand, I, I can spend the rest of the day tuning this to, to wherever I want to go. Now, that of course frustrates me is that I have to keep doing this tuning and, and I kind of get a feel of how each one of these parameters affects the answer and I can get to where I want to go. But SimSmith version 17 had an optimizer built into it, and it was a little clunky to use, and I went off to use it, and I could get it to work okay, but the reality was it wasn't very convenient. So version 18 is a rewrite of the optimizer capabilities inside SimSmith, and I decided to use those optimizer capabilities right now. So I've already done the circuit no need to watch me type things in i don't want to save this circuit and it's in my uh, optimizing and it is the optimized c capacitor transmission line inductor and here we have the circuit. So here's the circuit that Bill proposed. And I want to optimize this behavior. And here's the function that I want to optimize. Now, new in version 18 is this function right here called in circuit with. And in circuit with tells SimSmith to assign the parameters inside the parentheses and then having applied that, evaluate the circuit and return this value in case Zn, which is right here. You can put a complex statement out here, you can do function calls, all that sort of stuff. But the point is this construct in circuit with sets the parameters and evaluates the circuit. So I'm gonna do one impedance at 1.8 megahertz. I'm going to get another impedance at 3.6 and I'm going to compute the gammas the gammas distance from here to the center and then I'm going to return this value the gamma 1 squared and the gamma 2 squared. Now those familiar with optimizations this is a new field to me but I have discovered that the trick to getting the optimizers to work is in fact to getting the right function to optimize. Now 
Originally, I tried to return just to the sums of the gammas, figuring out that if one was far away, it would just continue to run. But that turned out to not work. And that turned out to not work because what would happen is one of these would get way out here, like 3.6 megahertz would get way out here and it would manage to optimize 160. And when it did that, it would get to that local minimum and then it would say, well, if I make a small change to improve 3.6 megahertz, it has an immediate and large impact on 1.8 and the sum of a little improvement and a bad movement here disimprovement would be worse and so it would optimize that condition so by squaring them what I've done is I've said the impact of these really small changes in the one that's in the center is minimized compared with the impact of the larger one change out here so if I just go ahead and run this Um, I, it's hard to know that it in fact ran. So let me set this to be 500 puff, this to be five feet, this to be two micro Henry's. That's kind of what it started out with. And now it's gonna to try to optimize this. I'm gonna say go. And this is what you get. It managed to perfectly optimize the 3.6. It didn't do so well here because there was no real way for this capacitor to get this to move down to the center. So that allows you to use the optimizer, this right here, this code, allows you to automate the process of tuning and that allows you to play with other topologies. Now, another topology that's quite common to do um, multi-band matching is, looks like this. So the technique here is to say, let me look at these two frequencies. At one frequency, I want to get this resistance on this circle. So I need a um, to get it onto this circle, I will need a shunt capacitor here to move this down. And to get my other frequency at 3.6 down onto this circle, I will need a shunt capacitor. So shunt capacitor here, shunt capacitor here. This parallel shunt LC allows you to do that sort of thing. So if I put this up here, I want to look at LC, not L. And if I play with this, I can play. So you, you can see uh, here I am again, I balancing Peter to pay Paul. And again, I have a topology, I just need to run the optimizer. So I'm gonna show you the optimizer code. Now here's a little different optimizer code. Um, I'm gonna show uh, differential evolution and Nelder need. And here's the function that I want to optimize. This should look familiar. It computes the impedance at two frequencies and it returns the square, the sum of the squares of the gammas. So I'm gonna run Nelder need. And fortunately, it gets both of the interesting frequencies into this point. Notice that I set the target Z to be 40. If I set it to be 50 and I run it again, I can get them to be both in the middle. There are times when you don't want to optimize at a slightly different frequency to maximize the bandwidth. So if we look back at the paths, we'll see at the low frequency, 
it moved down just a little bit to get to where you wanted to go. Notice it didn't put it on the 50 mark because the cues are non-zero. If the cues of these were zero, it would have moved this down directly. But it optimized it taking into account the cue. And if my cues were really bad, I can get, I can set my cues to be basically anything I want. And the optimizer code will take those cues into account. There's another optimizer called differential evolution. Uh, differential evolution is, is, has some other advantages, which I'll go to in a different video. But the one thing about Nelder Mead is that every time you run it, you get the same answer. That's not true with evolution. So if I run evolution, which takes a little longer, There we go. Every time you run evolution, you can get a different answer. So for example, in the, this turned out to be the best to configure out how to do. If I run it again, you'll see it comes up with a different answer. Now, that's the bad thing about differential evolution. The good news is it is a little better at dealing with uh, restrictions on parameter values. So you can tell it you only want capacitors in a given range and you only want inductors in a given range and it will figure out an optimal solution or at least a very good solution using those ranges. Nelder Mead doesn't deal quite so well with restrictions or constraints. Now looking at this, we see that there's really not a lot to be gained by moving here. And so this inductor, look at this, this inductor is 82 microhenries. It's entirely possible that I don't need that inductor at all. So let's see what happens. I can go to another topology. No, I don't want to save that. And go to just this topology and get rid of that inductor. So again, here's my optimizer. Same function as before, but in this case, I am just doing the capacitance, the capacitance of the second one and the inductor. And if I run Nelder Mead, it gets this answer. Now notice it's not quite as good on that 160. It's fine on the 80. This is familiar to the original didn't do quite so well. That's because it didn't have the ability to make this movement independent of this movement. So there you go. Now, having done three different topologies, one might want to compare them. And I did, in fact, do the comparison. And I put that in here. I don't want to save that. All three together. So here we have what's going on with the three different topologies. The, the one right here, the solid one, is this topology. The capacitor and series trap was that one. And the shunt parallel and the series series are here. You can see that they're basically the same. These two topologies were basically the same in the 160 meter band. And it's a little better. Um, that inductor didn't give us very much. And over here, I think this is not all the way to here because I had set the target impedance to be 40 instead of 50. And I can go back and, and check that, but I'm not gonna bother right now. But this lets you compare uh, the three different topologies. And interestingly enough, the three different topologies are pretty much the same. This seems to be 
a regular thing. I think it's dominated by the antenna and in fact not like your matching topology. So there you go. Started out with a simple problem um, needing to match two different frequencies to a measured antenna. Uh, kind of ad hoc came up with one topology and hand tune it with the wheel. Used the markers to show us where we were going and then decided to invoke the optimizer to automate the process of hand tuning. That allowed the the exploration of other topologies with relatively little frustration and in the end we could compare the three topologies. So hope that was interesting. If you're interested in playing with the optimizer it will be available for general use sometime in February. Uh, it's available now for for the ambitious if you want to be a beta tester drop me an email and I'll send you a pointer to it. The release date really depends on how much I can bang on it in the next several weeks. So thanks again. This is Ward Harriman, AE6TY. Thanks for watching and thanks for using SimsMethod.